Students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Budapest. I hope everybody is having a fantastic day, staying strong, staying healthy, and being studious. Hi, Mubina. Hi, Jai Neil. Hi, Abhiman, Carolina, Oas, Sammy. Good to see many of our members and nice to see many of our regular students. Hi, Sang. Hi, Maxine Yoon, Yan Hard. Nice to see you all. Uh, in this class, we're looking at an IELTS reading section. We will be practicing and improving our reading comprehension, our fluency, and our technique for getting those higher band scores. This material and the lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com. For academic IELTS success, Definitely visit us there for general IELTS. Check us out at gieltshelp.com. That's generaliltshelp.com. On both of our websites, we have loads and loads of materials to help you with your communication, with your English, and of course, higher band scores. This is our academic website here. You can uh, click that big red button to join our premium package. And then uh, same idea with the general IELTS, it's the green background and you can click that big red button to join our premium package there. Get access to over 100 hours of video lessons for all sections, as well as an interactive course. You can get our apps that connect to our websites. We really do have one of the most advanced online learning system for IELTS today, which is fantastic. And uh, it's worth spending a couple dollars to really improve quickly and efficiently. All right, if you have questions, uh, just send me an email, adrian at aehelp.com. I will gladly help you out. Hi, Eugene. Nice series of emojis to brighten our lives. I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. And uh, tomorrow we're going to have uh, some speaking part two and speaking part three classes as well. Uh, just a reminder, no class on Saturday this week. I will be away at a wedding. Um, so the next class after tomorrow's class will be on uh, Wednesday as usual. So for our regular students and newcomers as well, make sure to keep that in mind. Take note of that. All right, uh, without further ado, let's get into today's reading passage. This is a brand new one for you here today. Let me just get to the start of it here and zoom in a bit so you can see it even more. All right, so here we go. Um, there it is. That's the topic for today, students. So let's have a look. See, uh, this reading passage, it's uh, one of our newest ones uh, developed by our team. And uh, this one, it's kind of nice because it's not only good for IELTS, but it's just good knowledge in general for English learners. All right, uh, here we go. Uh, German and English differences and similarities. That is today's title for the reading passage. When you read that title, what do you think about? So what comes to mind when you read the title German and English differences and similarities? Now, clearly this is not a physical topic. It's abstract. It's about languages. Okay. So Manpreet says it's two different languages, kind of, Manpreet, it's different and it's similar, right? Abhishek says, I think of Germany, <laughs> okay? Uh, Erkin, good. So Erkin says the origin of two languages. Uh, Lepe says maybe some grammar and pronunciation. Very good. Um, Victor says thinking about the differences between the two languages. Abhishek says, European people. Very good. Abhiman says, I'm in Germany. It would help me to understand the similarities. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So we are getting some ideas. Maybe some of you know that English is a Germanic language. So English is rooted 
in German. Yeah, Beckjohn says there is similar vocabulary and similar alphabet. Absolutely. Okay, well, you know what? Let's try to get an even better idea by looking at the questions. Okay, so we look at the questions and we read the questions that have information contained in the passage. Okay, all right. So, uh, questions 27 to 30, uh, which paragraph contains the following information? So, um, should I read these uh, before the passage? Is it a good idea to read this type of question? Um, which paragraph contains the following information? Is this a good one to read before the passage? Beck Jen says, yeah, no, that's a good one. Abhishek agrees. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can read these before the passage because all of this information is somewhere in the passage. So it's a good idea to read it. Uh, so let's do that. Uh, let's read it. The development of English beyond its language antecedents. Hmm, what does that mean? Who cares? I don't know. We'll learn later. An example of English literature being similar to German in the past. Okay, so German writing or a German book that's kind of similar to English and some kind of example. All right, a key linguistic distinction in the naming of certain foods. Okay, so an important language difference in the words for some foods. Okay, all right. Uh, difficulties in English pronunciation. Hmm. Okay, so challenging English accents or pronunciation, good. All right, so we've read those ones. Those? Nope. Okay, uh, another question with uh, this uh, which paragraph contains the following information. Is it a good idea to try to skim read for the answers? So is it a good idea to read this and go, okay, the development of English beyond its language antecedents, and then go, all right, um, antecedents, this looks like an interesting word. I'm going to uh, skim read for this word. I'm going to scan, and as soon as I find this word, I probably know which paragraph it's coming from. Is that a good idea? And some of you are saying, no. <laughs> and Aga is saying, not at all. Yeah. No, it's a terrible idea. Okay. Um, absolutely no. So trying to skim read for these would be a horrible idea. There, you will most likely make mistakes. The IELTS examiners know this. So they make it so that you can't use this kind of, let's say, useless reading strategy. Okay, so no, for two reasons. One, um, you can see the word antecedent in the wrong paragraph. So firstly, you're not just looking for this word. Okay, you're not looking for this word, you're looking for this whole idea. Okay, so you're looking for the development of English beyond its ancestors. Okay, so you're looking for this whole idea. You're not just looking for this word. If you're looking for this word only, uh, in fact, you might find it in the wrong paragraph. Happens all the time. Okay, so you can actually find that in the wrong paragraph in a completely different context. Does that make sense? So it could be that the IELTS um, uh, test maker uses this word in a different paragraph uh, for different information and not for this information. Okay, does that make sense? That you can use that word in other contexts and they can do that. So if you look for that word, you can absolutely choose the wrong paragraph because you're not looking for this word. You're looking for this idea, this whole idea. That's number one. And then some of you already said this, that 
And many times they don't even use this word in the question. So they'll use a different word like ancestors or predecessors or some other word, okay, or a phrase, okay? So Nazarg says, yeah, that happens all the time, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Samina, this is for academic. Samina is asking, is this academic or general? Samina, it's academic, but remember that in the general version of the exam, section three reading is very similar, okay, to this one, all right? Yeah, so Carolina is saying, like, think like the creator of the test. Absolutely. So you want to think about it as the uh, test maker, all right? Okay, so yeah, you can't skim read for these questions. It's just not an effective strategy, and it would chew up a lot of time. Just imagine, uh, so this is another reason it would be a horrible idea. You're looking for this information, and you're literally skim reading the whole passage to realize that the, this information is in paragraph E or F. And you've had to skim read the whole passage to realize that, oh, it's in the last paragraph. If you do that for all of these, you will definitely run out of time before uh, you can answer all of the questions. Okay, so skim reading is usually a bad idea. All right, um, so here we go. Uh, this is uh, complete the summary. Okay, complete the summary. You can read it before you read the passage, read it quickly. Don't try to go into a lot of understanding or detail. Just read it nice and fast and then uh, read through the blanks. All of this is somewhere in the passage, so let's do that. Okay, so again, this is a reading class, so do read with All right, here we go. Uh, so it's not just listening, right? I'm not reading for you. Read with me. So two languages split into by another. German and English have a common ancestor known as Proto-Germanic. Uh, this language was spoken by people in Europe thousands of years ago. Because of this, English and German are considered something languages. However, there are also some differences between the two languages despite their common heritage. Though the English of 1,500 years ago was similar to German, the French-speaking Norman conquest of Britain in 1066 something the English language. All of a sudden, French words flooded into the country and its people's speech. This French influence is the source of the divergence between words like cow and beef. However, one word that did not follow this trend was, since its French equivalent looked like a negative sounding English word. While the French influence on English is clear, most of the most common words in English are still Germanic. Many words are even spoken similarly, that is, their something is roughly the same. Word order is one point of difference for German and English. A key aspect of German is that the verb always goes second. Conversely, in English, the verb can go almost something. Now, here are our choices. We don't look at those. Okay, that's not important. We'll get to those after we finish reading. And then here we have true, false, not given. True, false, not given questions. We don't know which are true. We don't know which are false. We don't know which are not given. So we don't read those, okay? There's a different strategy for that. They're a waste of time and confusing to read before the passage. So we just skip through those. All right. So uh, before I start reading, what is a good mental concept or what is a good way to visualize or kind of um, position yourself uh, before you uh, read this German and English differences and similarities. So anytime you read a passage or information, uh, you should read the title and then based on the title, so thinking about the title, you should create some kind of a position as a reader so that you can better understand the text. Okay, what kind of a position could you take here? Okay, so Alex says, I'm the author. 
being the author is okay, Alak Hyder, but it's probably too general. Okay. Okay, Sammy, very good. So Sammy says, I would just imagine a person speaking German and English in front of me. All right. Yeah, that would be a good, good position to uh, establish. Okay, so keep this in mind because this can really help to uh, understand and to answer much better, much faster. Okay, so this is an important tip. It's an important strategy. All right. So you should always create a mental position or context imagery before you begin reading a text based on the title and of course in the aisles based on your understanding of the questions uh, for example here uh, German and English similarities and differences okay so a couple of examples here would be uh, there are people in front of me uh, speaking English and German now the more specific that you can make it um, the better it is okay so there are let's say customs officers or border guards, okay? That's where often we'll see people carrying a dialogue in different languages is at the border, so at customs, okay? Um, another one that I think of is um, I'm learning both English and German at the same time, okay? So I'm studying German and I'm studying English, and that makes me much more interested and focused on this um, uh, information. Okay, so Alex says the Berlin connection to London. Sure. The Berlin connection to London. Yeah. Um, okay, so, or maybe some of you might think of World Cup uh, football, uh, England versus Germany. Okay, that might be a kind of an interesting one. They're two big rivals. Both are big football nations. Many people enjoy football in the world. And I guarantee you would hear a lot of English and a lot of German at that football match. Okay. So Jainil says, I'm German and I'm living in London. Absolutely. Sure, that would be another good way. So I'm German and I'm living in London. Okay, that's a brilliant uh, kind of position, Jainil. Okay. Uh, Kumar, you can always see the schedule on uh, our YouTube community board. Okay. So take one of these positions, just kind of get it in your head, visualize it. Okay. All right. And then you can start reading. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, yeah, Carolina, that's a good one too. Okay. So let's do this. Let's read together. Let's keep our visual images in mind and interpret nice and comfortably. Okay, nice and comfortably. Lots of good ideas now. I can see that. Chat. Okay, here we go. So this is reading, so make sure to read with me. So German and English, differences and similarities. German and English share a common ancestral language known today as Proto-Germanic, which was spoken by Western European peoples thousands of years ago. Just as people who share a common ancestor are related, languages that share a common ancestor are also related. English and Germans are sibling languages. They are each descendant from Proto-Germanic and therefore also share a number of linguistic features. However, the languages have also diverged significantly over the centuries and today, they have many notable differences in addition to their ancestral similarities. Okay, so here we've learned that German and English are sibling languages. They come from Proto-Germanic, and nowadays they share similarities and differences. Okay, good. Let's keep going. Here we go, and I bet you'll learn some interesting facts here too. 
To understand the similarities and differences of the two languages, a historical background is necessary. Topic sentence, I know right away that this paragraph is going to give me information about the historical background of the two languages. Okay? Old English, which was spoken from approximately 450 to 1150 CE, was very close to the German language of the period. But the Norman conquest of Britain in 1066 led to many linguistic changes. This is because the Normans were a French-speaking people, so they brought many French words into the English language, visualizing seeing French coming into English. And because French is a language that comes from Latin, many Latin words also came into the English language. In English, for example, the word cow comes from Proto-Germanic word ku, while the food obtained from cows, known in English as beef, comes from the French word boue. This Germanic-French distinction is also the reason why pig meat is called pork, sheep meat is called mutton, and deer meat is known as venison. Each of the animal names is of Germanic origin, while the food term comes from French. Interesting, right? One exception is the English word fish, which refers to both the animal and the food. This could be due to the French word for fish, poisson, being very similar to the English word poison, the name for a substance which can sicken or even kill. Let's keep going. Okay, so here we visualized. Uh, hopefully many of you picked up on these words, um, the difference of using the Proto-Germanic for the animal versus the food as the French word, right? Because the French are very culinary. There are many amazing French dishes, right? Um, so it's no surprise if we think of French food and delicious French cuisine, we can understand why English would use uh, the French words for the foods, okay? Here we go. Even with the French influence, however, 80 of the 100 most common words in English are Germanic in origin. For example, the phrase, I have, ich habe, the phrase, it is long, es ist lang, and the phrase, where is that, u ist das, u ist das, all of which, all of these words are clearly related. Other words are identical, although sometimes with different pronunciations. For example, the words baby, doctor, energy, machine, object, original, and school are virtually identical in either spelling, pronunciation, or both. All right, so Oas says, here we're talking about word origins, and we're really emphasizing the similarities between the German and English language. So even though we had a lot of French coming into the English, English is still mostly Germanic. All right. Interesting, interesting information. So here we go. Let's keep going. Uh, keep reading. So again, this is practice and how to improve. D. One of the key differences between German and English is the structuring of sentences. So right away, structuring of sentences, or in another words, grammar, right? While both English and German have certain rules for word order, these rules are very different. For example, in German, the conjugated verb is always second in the sentence, often travel I. English has no such requirement. Verbs can go first, running through the woods. Second, I run through the woods, or last, through the woods I run. However, German sentence word order is also freer in certain ways. Interestingly, this aspect of German is often compared to Shakespearean English, which is Old English. This is not a coincidence. In Shakespeare's time, around the year 1600 CE, English was still transforming from Middle English 
to modern English. Word order reflected the language's Germanic heritage. Today, this connection has faded, and Shakespeare's words, which are thought to school-aged children, which sorry, which are taught to school-aged children across the English-speaking world, seem almost foreign. Interesting tip for all of you: if you want a deep understanding of English, read some Shakespeare. Here we go. Uh, next one. So here in this previous paragraph. We learned about the grammatical differences. We learned about the transformation of English and about the example of Shakespearean English. Okay, so here we go, paragraph E. One notable difference between the language is that all nouns in German are capitalized while only proper nouns are capitalized in English, names and places primarily. In this sense, German is simpler, but German also has more cases than English. For example, German words can have three genders, masculine, feminine, and neuter or neutral. In general, English does not have these. While there are some words such as bachelor and bachelorette, which denote gender, almost every English noun belongs to a neuter, non-gender class of words. This is particularly notable since the two ancestral languages of modern English, German and French, both observe gender when naming nouns. This is an example of English evolving past both languages. While the influence of each language on English is marked, English has also had centuries of its own development. And one of its changes has involved losing its cases, such as gender nouns. For English learners, this makes mastering the language easier. All right. So here in this paragraph, I learned that, okay, there's a clear writing and in the cases of English versus German or French. Um, this means that English doesn't necessarily say male, female, or neutral like German or male, female like French, but it's just no gender denoted. Uh, this actually makes learning English easier. So that's a good thing for all of you learning English. IELTS would be more difficult if you had to learn that as well. Okay, uh, here we go with paragraph F. Keep reading with me. Another aspect of English, however, is very difficult. Unlike German, which is mostly a phonetic language, meaning that letters directly correspond to sounds, English is often hopelessly non-phonetic. Take the pair of words paid and said. By their appearance, these words should rhyme. Paid, said. Unfortunately, they are not even close. German, conversely, is much closer to the one-to-one -one correspondence between letters and sounds which many English learners have become or are accustomed to. English learners must instead learn an extraordinary number of exceptions which greatly complicates the language learning process. And that's why many IELTS students complain about pronunciation as well in the speaking section. Okay. Let's keep going. One last paragraph, the conclusion. Here we go. Uh, German and English are like distant cousins. They share an ancestor and share many similarities, but they also have many differences. French influence on English in the 11th century and onwards transformed the language, and the years since have only widened the gap between German and English. Yet, they also maintain a number of similarities, and after diverging millennia ago, there is still no major language closer to English than German. All right, so that's the information. Now let's get to the answers. Here we go. Um, so. 27, the development of English beyond its language antecedents. So here we go back to that first question, which paragraph, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, contains 
this information. Now, to do this, you might want to answer this, okay? So what is that? Uh, and we just read this. I even emphasized it. So let's see how many of you picked up on that, okay? So I even said, hey, this is uh, dealing with this. It was very clear. Anybody? So what is that? What was that? It's not B. It's not D. Uh, what is it? So remember, this means English developing beyond its ancestors. So some of you have the right answer. I don't want to tell you which one because a lot of you, I think, are just guessing. Uh, but what is that? What does that mean? So instead of trying to jump to the answer, tell me what that means, and then we'll know what the answer is. So Beck John says, I think that was uh, towards the end of the passage. Yeah? So if you're not sure, paraphrase it, growing its language ancestors. So what are, um, what are the ancestors? What is that? So what are the ancestors? Proto-German plus, plus French, right? And then you have English. And this is saying which paragraph talks about this stage, which is English past these. Okay. So I kind of remember that this was somewhere near the end. Okay. So E, F, G. It was in the last third, right? So Beckjohn's saying either G or E, so somewhere near the end. So E, F, G, somewhere there. So good, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to check from E. So I know that it's in the last third. Hopefully you followed my logic of how I paraphrased this and thought about what is that. And then I thought, okay, well, it's like E, F, G, okay? So... Here I'm going to go, one notable difference between the languages is that all nouns in German is capitalized. Okay, so some differences here. Uh, German also has more cases than English. Okay, so remember that he, she, girl, boy uh, difference of German and English. And then here it said, okay, well, uh, French also has this le and la um, difference as well. So they have the gender naming as well, but English. So this is an example of English evolving past both languages. While the influence of each language on English is marked, English has also had centuries of its own development, and one of its changes has involved losing its cases, such as gender nouns. So here is my answer. Okay, so English evolving past its antecedent languages, okay? All right, so the correct answer for 27 is E, okay? And this word was not in there. You probably realize that's what I was talking about. This word is not in there. Even if you don't understand this word, uh, you can still figure out the answer is E from this. The development of English beyond its language, whatever. So even just this, can still figure this out. Is that clear for everyone? That you can figure that out? It's challenging. It's a third, it's the third passage, but you can figure out this answer from this information alone. Okay. All right. <clears throat> a third passage is always going to be the most uh, challenging one. Okay, uh, 28. An example of English literature being similar to German in the past. Hopefully, everyone will figure that one out nice and fast. Uh, again, we visualize that one and emphasize that one. So that one should be fairly easy. So Prashant says B, Catherine says C, 
Ina says, I think that was D. Sammy says D. D seems to be very, very popular. Okay. Uh, Basanta, very good. So Basanta says, that's the Shakespeare part. So again, uh, you want to look for the answer. So many of you are saying, oh, that's the Shakespeare. Right? So it's the Shakespeare part. And so you're looking for Shakespeare, and you know it's somewhere in the middle. Okay? So you know the range, and you know the information. Okay? That's what you want, range and information. So we have the range, we have the information, and it's a nice information because we can uh, find names easily. So I'm just looking for the middle here. Okay, C, French influence, 80 to 100 words. That's maybe not it. Let's look at D. Uh, do I see the word Shakespeare anywhere? Ooh, look at that. Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. So my eye's catching that Shakespeare. So the correct answer then is D, right? And no need to look any further. The correct answer is D. And so we're going to... And D will give you the correct answer. Okay. All right. Uh, number 29, a key linguistic distinction in the naming of certain foods. All right. Um, so certain foods. I remember that. That was beef and cow and uh, pork and pig, right? Okay. Okay. So it was all those ones. And where was that? I think somewhere in the beginning, A or B. So I'm just going to go back there. I think it was B. Hey, there it is. Beef, pork, mutton instead of sheep, right? So good. All right, so now we know that it's B. Uh, so again, uh, and this is what happens when you read and you keep a catalog in your mind. You can answer these questions very, very quickly. Okay, so B, this one was E. And then now, uh, number 30, difficulties in English pronunciation. Okay, good. So what am I looking for here? What am I looking for here? Yeah, Rakesh, very good. So Rakesh said we're looking for paid and said. <laughs> yeah, okay, paid and said, because it sounds like it should be said and paid, but it's not. It's said and paid. Um, and we're looking for phonetics, right? We're looking for phonetics. So that is what we're looking for. And so we go back to, I think that was somewhere kind of in the middle as well. If I remember that one correctly or... The easier thing about English is they don't have gender. And then, so here, another aspect of English, however, is very difficult. Yes, I remember that. And it was uh, the pronunciation. So paid and said, right? Uh, so there it is. So F is the correct answer. Okay. So F. And now we have all the correct answers. Very good. So that's the strategy that how you answer these questions uh, correctly. Okay, let's go to this paragraph completion. Now, the trick with this, where we're completing this summary, is we kind of think of our own answer, and then we find the closest match from the choices. So here, the trick, students, is don't just stare at the choices, but just like with multiple choice, figure it out on your own or think the idea, and then afterwards match. Okay, so here we go. Um, Two languages split in two by another. All right, always read the title. 
So two languages, German and English, split in two by another. Which language? Which one is splitting uh, English and uh, German? Okay. So which one? That's right, French. Very good. Okay. So it's French. Yeah. Uh, French is splitting German and English. So we're keeping that in mind. So pay attention uh, to the title. Okay. Uh, let's read this. So German and English have a common ancestor known as Proto-Germanic. This language was spoken by people in Europe thousands of years ago. Because of this, English and German are considered what? What's the missing word here? I think many of you will remember this. It was a very visual. Yes, sibling. Very nice, Moria. Very nice, Aaron. Da Costa. Yes, yeah, sibling. Sibling languages. Now, you don't need the plural because you have languages, so sibling languages. Okay, now here, Germanic, right? Uh, we have the word choice here, so uh, we only need the letter. Um, which one is it? First, calcified, sister, anywhere, fish, significant, spelling, transform, few, pronunciation. Which one is the closest to sibling? We don't have sibling there, so we need to choose something else. Sister, yeah, because sisters are siblings and languages are usually referred to as women. So sister, feminine, I should say. So sister is correct. So all you do here in your answer sheet for 31 is the letter, not the word. Okay, so make sure you use the letter and not the word. Okay, letter and not the word. So E, okay, you have to put E into 31. All right. However, there are also something differences between the two languages despite their common heritage. Uh, what would you put in there? So Ferdov says uh, maybe notable. Yeah. Uh, Aaron says maybe significant. Yeah, I would say many or numerous or important. Sure. So let's see which one matches the closest. Okay. Uh, which one matches closest to uh, significant or numerous or many or important or notable? Which one is the closest to that? Yeah, J. Absolutely. So I would go with J. Okay. So that's the trick here is you're giving your own answer or matching. Don't try to look for the answer first because you'll get more wrong that way, okay? All right, though the English of 100 years ago was similar to German, the French-speaking Norman conquest of Britain in 1066 something the English language. All right, the French-speaking Norman conquest of Britain in 1066, what would you put in there? I would put maybe some kind of a verb Okay, uh, Moria says changed, Ois says influenced, yeah, so that's what I would put in there, changed or influenced, uh, affected, okay, verb form with an A, affected the English language, uh, Mary Zahn says transformed, Romaine says altered, um, yeah, so all of those are kind of similar, right? Change, influence, effect, alt. All right, uh, let's take a look. Which one's the closest match to changed or altered or modified? Which one? I can definitely see one right away. It looks good. Sammy and everybody else says F for transformed. Yeah, I agree. That's the closest. So I would put F transformed the English language. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you see how that goes? Everything's clear now on the best strategy for this. You have to read it and then figure out 
the word that you would put in there and then match a word that's the closest. So here we go. All of a sudden, French words flooded into the country and its people's speech. This French influence is the source of the divergence between words like cow and beef. However, one word that did not follow this trend was 34. Nazarg says, fish, maybe. Beck John says fish. Ferdob says fish. Abhishek says fish. Everybody says fish. And hey, look at that. We have a perfect match. Fish, right? So tell me why fish just stayed fish for food and for the animal. So why didn't the word fish change? Okay. Why, why didn't we change it to poisson? Such a fantastic word. I love the French word for fish, poisson. Victor says, because it sounds like poison. Yeah. Hey, uh, would you like some uh, beef, a steak, uh, maybe some pork, or would you like a little bit of poisson? Did you just offer me poison? Ooh. Yeah, that might not go over too well in the restaurants, especially for non-native speakers. Um, so yeah, makes sense. All right. So here we go. Um, let's do this. Let's keep going. Okay. Uh, since it's French equivalent looked like a negative sounding English word like poison, right? Um, while the French influence on English is clear, most of the most common words in English are still Germanic. Many words are even spoken similarly. That is, their something is roughly the same. What is the same? So many English and Germanic words are spoken similarly. That is, their something is roughly the same. What is the same in your own? Their pronunciation or their spelling is the same. Um, <clears throat> now, some of you are saying spelling. Some of you are saying pronunciation. Only one can be correct. And we have both pronunciation and spelling. So which one is it? Is it B or is it H? Only one can be the right answer. And maybe you're saying our, our B. Okay, let's go B. Why is it B? And B is the right answer. Okay. I know for 100% that it's B. Why is it B? Even though H is correct. Because of this double hyphen. It means that spoken similarly is equal to this. Okay. So even though theoretically um, spelling is correct, whenever you use this symbol in writing, which is the hyphen between two elements in a sentence, it means that this sentence element is the same as this sentence element. And here we're talking about speaking and not writing. So here we have to talk about speaking, not writing. Hmm. Does that make sense? Everybody got that? So this hyphen guarantees for me that this word is pronunciation because we're talking about speaking and not writing. Okay? So careful, pay attention. Pronunciation, or sorry, pronunciation is important. All right? Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> moving along, a little bit more here. Word order is one point of difference for German and English. A key aspect of German is that the verb always goes second. Conversely, in English, the verb can go almost, uh, what's the right answer here? For 36. So in English, the verb can go almost, Sammy says, anywhere. That's one of the fun parts of English. You can go to the store, to the store you can go, or he goes to the store. Um, yeah, just about anywhere. Do we have a match? We sure do. 
G anywhere. G it is. Anywhere. Fantastic. All right, students, let's take a peek at the last four questions. These are true, false, not given. I don't want to rush through these, and I think this is a fun challenge for many of you. We have a strategy, an HD video, so not a live class video, but an HD video for true, false, not given on our YouTube channel. Please check that video that shows you the strategy for how to solve true, false, not given questions quickly, accurately, with a high level of confidence. Once you do that, come back to this passage, read it again, it's great knowledge anyway, and then answer these last four questions. After you do that, you can send me your answers and I will reply with the answer key and you will see whether you got them correct or not. So here are the questions again, you will see them at the end of the video and you can send your answers to uh, Adrian at aehelp.com and I will send you the answer key. Okay. So I hope everybody enjoyed this class. I hope you learn, uh, you enjoyed learning about uh, the origins of the English language. And uh, I wish all of you a fantastic rest of your day. Be sure to uh, visit and get our premium package at aehelp.com for academic IELTS, gltshelp.com for general IELTS. It's worth spending a couple dollars and really um, advancing in your communication in English. You're very welcome, Eugene. You're welcome, everyone. Nice to see all of the thank yous. Much love back at you, Alex, and to all of you around the world. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I will be back tomorrow with some lessons on the speaking section for parts two and three. Take care. I'm Adrian signing out from Budapest. Bye for now.